I've said many times that Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition is a great game, but I've also said many times that it's not perfect. There are plenty of rules here and there that should be changed a little. And some of these rule changes are given in the Dungeon Master's Guide itself. Some of them are great, some of them are situationally fun, and some of them you don't really ever need. So here's my stab at ranking them on the internet's favorite method of comparison, in terms of how often each rule will make gameplay more fun. For this video, I'll be going through every rule in the Dungeon Master's Workshop, from page 263 to 273 of the DMG. But before getting into the rules themselves, I'm going to briefly go over what each tier means. In F tier, we have variant rules that are some combination of nonsensical, cumbersome, or just plain unfun compared to the base mechanics. And I don't really think that they should be used under any circumstances, except maybe in a deliberately unbalanced one-shot that's supposed to annoy your players. In D tier, we have rules that I personally dislike for one reason or another, but I can see them being useful to some DMs in some unorthodox campaigns. Although, even in those situations, you might have better options, or you should maybe revise the rule a little bit. C tier consists of rules that I'm more or less indifferent toward. Maybe there's a certain campaign where they might come in handy as written, but I'm not super excited about running that campaign anytime soon. In B tier, we have rules that I actually like and use from time to time, but I wouldn't want to use them all the time. Maybe they'll affect the tone of the campaign, or work best for a specific type of party, so you should think before using them, but they're all worth trying out sometime. In A tier, we have rules that I'll usually play with, and I think they're generally better than the base rules. I pretty much recommend them to all DMs regardless of campaign, but I won't really get mad if you decide to use the base rules, because compared to S tier rules, A tier rules generally have pretty minor effects on your campaign. Finally, S tier consists of variant rules that I think radically change the game for the better. If you're not using one of these rules, then you're doing yourself a disservice. They'll probably replace mechanics that I'm not a fan of in the base game, and I don't see any reason to use the base mechanics except in scenarios so specific that I can't even think of any of them. With that intro out of the way, let's get onto the list. Proficiency Dice. This variant rule basically replaces your proficiency bonus with a roughly equivalent die. For example, at level 1, you get to add a d4 to all rolls you're proficient in instead of the flat plus 2 bonus, which upgrades to a d6 at level 5, a d8 at level 9, and so on. I do not like this rule, because it adds an unnecessary degree of extra randomness to an already highly random core mechanic. Given the generally low numbers in 5e compared to earlier editions, a character's skill or attack modifiers can already be outshined by the variability of a d20 roll, and results are unpredictable enough that it's not too uncommon for a clumsy paladin to outsneak a master thief. This isn't a bad thing by itself, but I don't think that the game should be any more random than it already is. Making the proficiency bonus itself depend on a die roll will make results so erratic that it'll seem like no one is really better at anything than anyone else. Sure, this rule won't completely break your game, but I don't see any reason to ever use it. Because of this, proficiency dice land comfortably in F tier. Ability check proficiency. With this variant rule, characters don't have skill proficiencies, and instead they gain proficiency in two types of ability checks, one from their class and one from their background. Proficiency in dexterity gives a bonus to acrobatics, sleight of hand, and stealth. Proficiency in charisma gives a bonus to deception, persuasion, performance, and intimidation, etc. This rule is garbage. First of all, some ability check proficiencies are way more useful than others. Strength proficiency gives you just athletics, while wisdom proficiency gives you perception, insight, medicine, animal handling, and survival. Second of all, every single character gets only two ability check proficiencies, which is totally unfair to rogues and bards, who are supposed to have proficiency in a whole bunch of skills. Third of all, it destroys nuance. You can't have a menacing warlord who is great at intimidation but can't keep a straight face when lying. I've racked my brain and tried to think of a single reason why a DM would want to use this variant, and my only guess is to simplify the game for new players. But skill proficiency is not a complicated mechanic, and I'd think that even brand new players would be able to tell how useless strength proficiency is compared to wisdom proficiency. So yeah, this is another F tier mechanic. We're not off to a great start. Background proficiency. This rule is similar to the last in that characters don't have skill proficiencies, 
and instead add their proficiency bonus to any ability check that seems relevant to their background. I have mixed feelings about this rule. On the one hand, it can really encourage players to take their backstories seriously, and tying backstories directly to game mechanics can let the characters be seen as actual characters, rather than just sets of abilities. On the other hand, this role would involve so many edge cases that the character's proficiencies might either be harshly limited or stretched beyond believability. For example, the DMG gives this piece of potential background text. I spent three years as my family's ambassador to the court, and this sort of thing is second nature to me now. At first glance, this seems like it would give a proficiency bonus toward any social role in a noble court. But as it stands, that's pretty limited compared to something as broad as deception or persuasion. Would you allow this character to add their proficiency bonus in the alien and sinister courts of the yuan -Ti? Or at a meeting between leaders of a thieves' guild? Game balance says you probably should, but I would picture a literary or cinematic character struggling in this new environment. And this rule is clearly trying to emulate those more narrative stories. As written, I think that the background proficiency rule lands in C tier, but I'd be more excited to try this rule if it was used in combination with skill proficiencies for an occasional bonus here and there. For example, it makes sense for someone who grew up in a royal court to be proficient in persuasion and probably deception, but not necessarily slate of hand. However, the same character might be familiar enough with high fashion that they know the right way to reach into someone's suit pocket and grab a purse without them noticing, and therefore get to use their proficiency bonus in that specific situation. When used sparingly like this, background proficiency moves up to B tier. Personality trait proficiency. Similar to background proficiency, with this rule, characters don't have skill proficiencies, and instead add their proficiency bonus to roles that are relevant to their personality traits. I'm not really a fan of this, mostly because compared to backstory, personality doesn't have much to do with a person's capabilities. What sort of personality is more likely to succeed a long jump across a chasm, or scavenge for food in a barren wasteland? Personality will certainly affect the action a character takes, but it shouldn't really dictate how likely it is that they succeed. Even if you can connect every ability check to a personality trait, I feel like this rule would encourage players to effectively min-max their personalities, which can make characters seem especially artificial. For example, the DMG itself states that, I never have a plan, but I'm great at making things up as I go along, is a valid personality trait. That could give a bonus on at least half of all roles in the game without much of a stretch. Compare that to a trait like, I prefer the company of animals to people which would only give a bonus on animal handling checks, and maybe a handful of nature and survival checks. Some parties might be able to roll with this, especially if no one is really into optimization, but it would require lots of individual rulings as to when a character's personality would give a bonus to a roll. To me, if I wanted to play a fantasy RPG with qualitative and abstract mechanics, I'd look at something like Fate or Dungeon World. This kind of thing just fits awkwardly in a game like D&D, as it would use very loose rules for skill checks, but very precise rules for everything else. All in all, I'm gonna have to put personality trait proficiency in D tier. Hero points. Now, here's a mechanic I actually like. Hero points are basically a resource that allows a character to add an extra D6 to any D20 roll, and they're only replenished after leveling up. They're useful in campaigns with newer players who haven't mastered the system, or even with experienced players, if the party is small, or if you want a feeling of truly epic adventure, in which the PCs are expected to hold their own against groups of high-level monsters. Sure, I wouldn't use hero points in a darker campaign, or with a party of highly optimized builds, but they're a very simple addition, and you shouldn't hesitate to use them if you think your party could use a safety net. I'll put hero points in B tier. Honor and Sanity these are two entire ability scores that you have the option of adding to people's character sheets. My opinions on the two of them are slightly different, so I'll start with Honor. This score is meant for campaigns based around things like Samurai or Knightly Orders, and it represents a character's devotion to their cause, as well as their social prestige within it. The ideas for honor checks and saving throws are mostly really cool, although even in a campaign where they'd be relevant, I don't expect them to come up super often. Because of this, players will likely be tempted to dump honor in order to raise their other stats. Thankfully, the DMG states that the Dungeon Master should be able to raise or lower a character's honor score depending on how they act, 
so the score doesn't have to stay low for the whole game. Still, I'd recommend letting players generate the other six ability scores as normal, and just let them start with a decent but not stellar honor score, like something between 12 and 14. Although, you could maybe make an exception and treat honor like you do all the other ability scores if you let the character use honor as their spellcasting ability, which I can see working for a paladin or even some clerics. All in all, I'll put honor at the high end of C tier. It's mostly functional, and it could be cool in a niche type of campaign, but I don't really feel the urge to run that campaign right now, and even if I did, I would tweak it a little bit. The other optional ability score is Sanity, which is supposed to measure a character's ability to remain calm in the face of unimaginable horrors. I'm less keen on this one because Honor felt unique and this doesn't. Pretty much anything that calls for a Sanity saving throw is just as well suited to a Wisdom saving throw, and if that save ends in catastrophic failure, then I think it works just fine to permanently reduce Wisdom instead of reducing Sanity as the book suggests. In one word, the sanity score is redundant, and it's going in D tier. Besides, a heroic adventuring game like D&D isn't the best fit for existential horror anyway. If you want to play Call of Cthulhu, then go play Call of Cthulhu. Fear and Horror. These are two related rules for darker campaigns, and they're both pretty simple. Let's start with Fear. When an adventurer confronts a threat that they have no hope of overcoming, then they have to make a wisdom save or become frightened for one minute and they can repeat the saving throw at the end of each turn. Given the key phrase, a threat that they have no hope of overcoming, this rule isn't going to come up very often, but it's pretty much always warranted when it does. Ordinary baddies aren't going to trigger this save. We're talking about the glowing eyes of a pit fiend emerging from a cavern, or the Dark Lord's entire army pouring over the hills. It makes sense for even veteran adventurers to be shaken up by something like that. Because of this, we're looking at our first A-tier mechanic of the day, something that I'll regularly use in my games. The rule for horror is a little different. It's designed for campaigns with Lovecraftian elements and calls for a charisma save when a character is confronted with alien or deeply unsettling imagery. If they fail the save, they contract some form of short-term or long-term madness. Again, simple and functional, and I could see myself using it if I wanted to run a game with those kinds of horror elements but it isn't as universally applicable as the fear rule, so it lands squarely in B tier. Healer's Kit Dependency This one is super simple. It just requires characters to have been bandaged with a healer's kit before rolling hit dice. I don't have any strong feelings about this one. I guess it's useful if you want the players to be concerned about resource management, but all in all, I'm still feeling really meh about this. C tier. Healing Surges with this rule, characters can basically spend hit dice as an action in the middle of combat once per short rest. Like hero points, healing surges can make a pretty decent safety net for newer players or smaller parties, but it might make the heroes too powerful if they're controlled by experienced players. Like hero points, healing surges land in B tier. Slow Natural Healing This variant makes it so that instead of restoring all their health after a long rest, they can only use hit dice like they would during a short rest. I could see this being pretty fun in a somewhat grittier or more hardcore campaign where the PCs need to rest for multiple days inside a dangerous area while being at risk of ambush the entire time. I'll put it in B tier. Rest Variants Normally, a short rest takes 1 hour and a long rest takes 8 hours. I've said in a previous video that I'm not a huge fan of this dichotomy, since if players can safely rest for an hour, they can usually rest for 8 hours, making short rests pretty useless. So, let's see what Wizards offers as alternatives. The first variant is Epic Heroism, which makes short rests only 5 minutes and long rests only 1 hour, although it does suggest requiring a full 8 hour rest to recover high level spell slots. Dear god, this will make your PCs able to accomplish a lot in a very short amount of time. I like the idea of short rests being only 5 minutes in order to keep characters like Warlocks useful, but making long rests only an hour makes it so that the PCs can take on fight after fight literally without ever needing to sleep. They'd probably be able to clear Barad-dûr in a single day. But some campaigns are all about that. Personally, if I wanted to run a super high-powered fantasy game where the PCs can take on gods one-handed, I would look at other systems like Exalted or Mythic Pathfinder, but I still might run a one-shot or short campaign with this rule if my group is only familiar with D&D. 
Plus, this rule won't fundamentally change how combat works. It'll just let your PCs expend resources more flippantly. Because of that, to me, epic heroism just barely edges out into B tier. The other resting variant is gritty realism, which makes short rests 8 hours and long rests a whole week. I'm not quite as keen on this one because D&D isn't really compatible with this level of gritty realism in general, and not just because it has elves and dragons in it. There are plenty of fantasy RPGs where the characters seem believable in terms of their capabilities, like A Song of Ice and Fire and Burning Wheel. In those systems, even a single hit from a weapon feels extremely deadly, and magic is a rare force that can only be harnessed by a few characters. Meanwhile, even in a fairly low-level D&D party, it's likely that more than half of the characters can cast spells. And those who can't can still do crazy things like deflect arrows with their hands, or tank seven sword strikes and fight on like nothing's happened. With the gritty resting rules, they technically won't be able to do those things as often, but even seeing a PC do something like that once can damage the realistic feel. Plus, it might lead to some silly exchanges where a PC insists that he can only pull off that awesome move once per week, which usually aren't what you want in a gritty campaign. Because of this, I'm putting gritty realism in C tier. I can see it maybe working in a campaign of mostly non-magical classes that doesn't go past low levels, but I'd personally look at other systems for very grounded fantasy games. Firearms and Explosives I don't have much to say about these, they're about as well designed as all the other weapons, and it's up to the DM in terms of who gets to be proficient in firearms, which will probably depend on how common they are in the campaign world. Modern and futuristic firearms probably won't be used very often, but I think that Renaissance era items are at home in most D&D campaigns. Whether the whole world has that level of technology, or they're restricted to a single industrious nation. Sure, there are some scenarios where you'll want to enact gun control, like a campaign inspired by ancient Greece, or if you're running a game for young kids and you don't want to remind them of real world violence. But otherwise, you should probably let a player use a pistol or a musket if they want to. The only weird quirk comes with the explosive system. A bomb costs significantly more than a powder horn even though it has a smaller explosion radius for the same amount of damage. So be sure to adjust the prices. I'd recommend bringing the bomb price down to only 20 gold pieces or so. Other than that, you're good. I'll put the firearm rules in A tier. Alien Technology I have even less to say about this rule. It's very simple, pretty functional, and I'd use it whenever my PC stumbles upon alien technology but that's not going to come up very often, so I'll put this rule in B tier, pretty much by default. Plot points. Now this is interesting. This variant rule gives players a very limited supply of currency that they can use to shape the story in ways normally limited to the purview of the DM. There are three options on how to do this. The plot thickens, in which a player can spend a plot point to have something appear or be discovered in the world. What a twist, which is the same as above, except that the player to their right must add an additional complication, and the gods must be crazy, in which anyone can spend a plot point to become the DM until someone else spends a plot point to take the position from them. I think that the first two versions of this rule have a ton of potential, especially in sandbox type campaigns. The gods must be crazy might get out of hand pretty quickly, but it can still be very fun in a one-shot. But with an open-ended premise and active, experienced players, those first two rules could lead to an amazing campaign. This is probably the most exciting mechanic in the whole list, but I still don't think it should be used in every game, so I'm gonna have to put it in B tier. But I'll make it purple to indicate that it's a special B tier. And I should also mention that this mechanic has nothing to do with the rest of the D&D rules, so you can comfortably use it in pretty much any other RPG. Initiative Score this rule makes it so that characters have a static initiative score instead of rolling for initiative, and it's stupid. Rolling for initiative is a fun part of the game, and replacing it with something monotonous is never a good idea unless you're super pressed for time. I'm gonna put it in D tier. Side initiative. With this rule, the players make a single roll as a group, and the DM makes a single roll for the monsters. During the player's mega turn, the players can take action in any order they want, and the same for the monsters on the DM's turn. If you are really pressed for time and you want fights to start super quickly, then I think this is a better option than initiative scores, since it still involves some unpredictability. 
but I personally don't think I'll ever need it. I'll put it in C tier. Speed Factor. This rule basically adds a bunch of conditional modifiers to a character or monster's initiative modifier based on their size, weapon type, spellcasting, etc. They all make sense, and I could see some DMs using these rules, but I don't think I need this level of micromanaging in my games. Plus, it's unlikely that all of my players will remember these rules, so I'll put Speed Factor at the high end of C tier. Now we've moved on to the action options, and I'm just gonna say it, the rules get a lot better from here. All of these combat mechanics are pretty balanced, and it's always nice for martial characters to have extra options and encounters. Climbing onto a bigger creature. This rule basically makes it so that a character can climb onto a large or larger creature as an action, and gains advantage on all attacks against that creature for as long as they're on top of it. The fact that this mechanic exists and is functional, automatically earns it a high tier spot. Pretty much any fight against a giant monster in fiction involves one of the heroes climbing on top of it and stabbing it, so there should absolutely be a way to do that in D&D. For this rule, I'd only make the small tweak of not always requiring a full action to climb onto a creature, in order to encourage players to actually use this mechanic more often. For example, a rogue should be able to climb a creature using cunning action, and I might let characters with extra attacks attempt a single strike against the creature right before or after getting a hold of it. Otherwise, players might find it more effective to just keep attacking the creature from the ground, which is less exciting. Overall, we have a combat option that can inspire epic fights and just needs one little change to make it perfect. Solid A tier. Disarming. With this rule, a character can attempt to knock someone's weapon out of their hands with an attack roll contested by the defender's athletics or acrobatics check. The book gives a couple of special conditions in which either combatant has advantage or disadvantage on their roll, like if a small attacker is trying to disarm a large creature. I don't think that there's anything wrong with this rule. Some people might think that it can be taken to extremes, but I don't think it'll get out of hand. It takes a full attack to attempt to disarm, and it's very possible for a defender to carry a backup weapon, even if it's a smaller weapon like a short sword or hand axe. And the rules state that drawing a weapon is basically a free action, so disarming isn't an instant win button if you don't want it to be. Plus, DMs shouldn't forget that monsters can disarm the heroes as well. All in all, this is a great mechanic that puts a new twist on combat, and it fits at the very high end of A tier. Marking. This rule allows a character to designate one enemy as its target, and can make opportunity attacks against that target without using their reaction. I think that this rule is just fine, but maybe a little underwhelming. I expected something more in line with the 4th edition marking rules, where the marked enemy would be penalized for attacking anything other than you. It's also kind of strange that there's absolutely zero cost to marking an enemy, it doesn't even eat up your bonus action. All in all, this rule barely changes the game, and I'd probably allow it if any of my players really cared about using it, but it's nothing that I'm excited about. I'll put it at the upper end of C tier. Tumble and Overrun. These mechanics are technically listed separately, but they work basically the same, and they end up in the same tier. Basically, in order to move through an enemy's space with this rule, a character can attempt an acrobatics check to tumble or an athletics check to overrun and if they beat the enemy's check of the same type, then they can freely move through that space. By default, you don't need to make a roll at all to move through an enemy's space, it's just counted as difficult terrain. And I think that this variant rule is better. The number of circumstances in which you need to move right through an enemy's space instead of just running past them is pretty small, mostly limited to holding choke points as far as I can imagine. But if you're actually trying to get past a choke point, then it should require a skill check instead of just an extra square of movement. All in all, a very good mechanic that fixes something that deserves fixing. Solid A tier. Shove aside. This one just allows you to use the shove action to move someone to the side instead of forward, provided that you make an attack at disadvantage. It's super simple, and I can't think of a reason not to allow it. Another A tier. Hitting cover. With this variant, if a character misses a target behind cover, but would have hit the target if not for the cover, then they can deal damage to the object used for cover. This rule is a little silly to me. Usually, something like a stone battlement or tree is much easier to hit than a mobile defended target. Partially because it's much bigger. So, not every square inch covered by the object in question would have amounted to a hit if that cover weren't there. It seems ridiculous for a PC to have a significant chance of missing a stationary tree, especially at melee range. 
As it stands, I'll put the hitting cover mechanic in D tier, but I would use it with just one simple change. The attacker will deal damage to the cover on any miss, not just a very narrow miss as stated in the rules as written. With that modification, hitting cover moves up to B tier, well suited to groups that want a meticulous, tactical edge to combat encounters, but maybe not for those who want to keep the pace as fast as possible. Cleaving through creatures. This one makes it so that if a character one-shots a monster, they can deal excess damage to an adjacent monster. There's not much to say here other than that I like this rule and I use it in my games. Fights against massive groups of low-level monsters can make the players feel more heroic than any other type of encounter, and slicing through two foes at once will make your characters look even more badass. A tier. Lingering Injuries with this rule, characters will occasionally suffer a major wound when brought to zero hit points, stricken with a critical hit, or failing a death save. The wounds can range from an unsightly scar, to internal bleeding, to even a lost foot or eye. I think that this rule is pretty unfun for most players. A martial character who loses a limb is drastically nerfed, and the book doesn't give a way to grow it back other than the high level regenerate spell. It's possible that this rule could work in a short, super gritty, low-level adventure about survival at all costs, but personally, getting disfigured and dismembered left and right isn't something that I want in a heroic adventure game like D&D. I'll put Lingering Injuries at the low end of C tier. Massive Damage This one basically makes it so that if a character takes damage equal to or greater than half their hit point maximum, then they have to make a constitution save or suffer a random effect such as immediately dropping to zero hit points or being stunned for a round. I think that I might pull out this rule if combat encounters start taking too long, or if the dynamic is really focused on things like ambushes and sneak attacks. I'll put it in B tier. And last but not least, we have morale. This variant rule just says that enemies should think about fleeing if they're injured, watch their allies die, or are caught off guard. This is barely even a rule, it's just something every DM should remember to take into account. With the exception of mindless creatures like golems, and maybe some particularly insane cultists, next to no one is just gonna keep charging into the enemy when they're dealing with three gaping wounds and stepping over the bodies of their comrades. Even if a creature is hell-bent on avenging those comrades, they're better off finding reinforcements or striking later from the shadows than just charging suicidally into the hero's swords. If enemies will sometimes surrender or flee, not only will your campaign feel more immersive, you can even add a tinge of moral ambiguity by showing that even brutish monsters can still sometimes feel human emotions. Like I said, this rule has very little in the way of actual mechanics. It just recommends the leader of a group of enemies to make a DC 10 saving throw in any situation where they seem overwhelmed, possibly making the roll at disadvantage, using a higher DC, or even failing automatically in extreme circumstances. I think that every DM should keep enemy morale in mind, and because of this, we're looking at the one and only S tier mechanic of the day. So that was a lot. It turns out that these rules really run the gamut from definitely recommended for any game to why would anyone ever use this, with a pretty even spread among all tiers, at least outside of the two extremes. What do you all think? Is there any rule you think I've slept on, or have you tried using one of the ones I recommend and think that it's a waste of time? Leave your answers in the comments below. Anyway, there are definitely some other mechanics that qualify as variant rules in the DMG as well as in some of the other books, so if this video does well, I might make a part two sometime. Anyway, thanks for watching, and see y'all next time.